Amen. <laughs> uh, it's great to see you. Um, Father, we ask that you'd help us to preach. And I already said amen, but amen means for sure. So help us preach for sure, Lord God. And I pray that you would help, uh, well, that Jesus, you would connect the dots. You're the way, you're the logic, you're the reason. So by your spirit, would you connect the dots? I, I pray that especially since this is really the second half of last week's sermon, but even more because, God, the picture is so beautiful, it's so deep, and it's so profound that, that I can't connect the dots. We need your spirit to connect the dots. Help us to see you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. In uh, 1962, Don Richardson took his young wife and infant son to uh, Netherlands, New Guinea, in order to minister to the Sawi people. The Sawi people in New Guinea at the time were cannibals living in the Stone Age. Uh, utterly amazed at Don Richardson and Western, uh, Western technology, they had never come in contact with a white man before. And so fascinated with Richardson's white skin and his technology, three of the Sawi tribes moved in right around the Richardson uh, family jungle, jungle home, the home they built in, in the midst of the jungle. After an immense amount of, of work, uh, Richardson learned the Sawi language and then one day climbed the ladder into the Sawi man house where surrounded by human skulls, he began to tell the story of, uh, story of, of Jesus. He told them about the Jews and the sacrifices, the Lamb of God, and they were just uninterested. But when he began to tell them about Judas, they all perked up. Because in Sawi culture, uh, uh, for a person to befriend an enemy, uh, feign friendship, and then betray that enemy and deliver that enemy up, well, that was seen as an admirable characteristic. And so Richardson, <laughs> at that point, just gave up gave up on trying to share the gospel with them. He told the Saudi that he was leaving due to the fact that he didn't know how to tell them what he wanted to tell them, and due to the fact that 14 civil wars had broken out among the Sawi, uh, all in close proximity um, around the Richardson jungle home since they had arrived. Well, desperate to keep the Richardsons and their Western technology the Sawi elders came together and they came to Richardson and they said, if you don't leave, we'll make peace. In his book, Peace Child, Richardson describes how he woke the following morning to witness the most passionate ritual that he had ever seen. In a clearing in front of their jungle home, two of the Sawi tribes had lined up on either side of this clearing. The air was tense, the people were nervous, when all of a sudden, this young one man, he, he took his baby from his wife's arm, held the baby up in the air, and then uh, ran across the clearing as his wife followed, screaming and crying and rolling in the mud. And then in absolute agony, this young father handed his baby to members of the other tribe. And then he watched as the very same thing with the same affect happened uh, as members of that tribe gave a baby to the first tribe, and then the people explained to Richardson that that was how they made peace. And as long as the child lived, uh, the child from one tribe, then in the other tribe, as long as that child lived, as long as that peace child lived, they could trust the other tribe. As Richard didn't watch this, he said he suddenly realized that he was, an obser he was observing an, an altar to the unknown God, like the one that Paul found when he walked through Athens so many years before. Well, the peace child in, in New Guinea uh, held over the ensuing months as whenever violence threatened, when, whenever people, uh, tension would break out between the tribes, the members of the tribe would claim the peace child. And so finally, Richardson climbed the ladder into the manhouse once again, several months later, and this time he read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He explained that the Father did not give his Son because he hated his Son, but because his Son was his very own heart. And so all the passion, all that passion, was the passion of love. It was the passion of that young father that he had witnessed in the field that morning when, when the Sawi uh, made peace. That seems to be something that modern Americans no longer understand. And that is that a true sacrifice is not destroying something that you hate. A true sacrifice is surrendering your greatest treasure for the sake of love. When old Abraham prepared to offer Isaac, he was offering his dream, his hope. He was offering his heart to the one that gave Isaac to him in the first place. And according to the book of Hebrews, he trusted that God could give him back, raise him from the dead even, and, and actually God did. God did give Isaac back because God provided a lamb. And of course, we know that the lamb is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And not only did God the Father offer Jesus the Son, we know that Jesus the Son offered himself, and God the Father was in God the Son as he made the, the offering. Well, toward the end of Richardson's book, about six years later, on Christmas Day, one of the Sawi men threatens to start, start a war when he discovers that this other man that had come to the Christmas celebration, uh, this other man from a neighboring tree discovers this man from a neighboring tribe who had killed his brother who had been given to this other tribe by his father as a peace child. Uh, but Richardson jumps in and pleads the peace child saying this, but our father in heaven gave Jesus, the prince of peace, to this man in his tribe too, and that peace child, that peace child lives. God gave him to all of us. We all killed him. We even ate him. And he lives. Well, a war was abated that day. And no more peace children needed to be given. The one that's been given is forever more than enough. A war was abated that Christmas day, and along with hundreds of new believers, the Richardsons celebrated the birth of the Prince of Peace, for the government was on his shoulders. Acts chapter 17. This is the second half of last week's message. Remember, it was titled, Seek, or Christmas in Athens, we read how Paul dialogued with the pagan philosophers, and he found this altar to an unknown God and declared, what you therefore have worshiped as unknown, I proclaim uh, to you this day. And we conjectured that God must use all things to build altars like that in every nation, every tribe, including the Sawi, and even every heart, including your heart. I said he builds the altar and even supplies the lamb. The altar is the longing for love, and the lamb is the decision to love. The altar is a manger, and the lamb is the prince of peace. Verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day he dialogued with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And, and so they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. That's Ares Hill or, or Mars Hill. You know, Ares is the Greek, Mars is the Latin. And Mars is the god of war. And so Jesus, Prince of Peace versus Mars, the god of war. This, this is kind of interesting. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Last time I told you what ancient 
Greek manuscripts uh, reveal how 600 years earlier there had been a plague in Athens and how the Athenians sacrificed lambs to an unknown God, hoping that this God was maybe great enough and good enough that he would forgive them and deliver them from the curse. And, and then he did, and then how they had preserved at least one altar in the hope that one day this unknown God would reveal himself. I found also an altar with this inscription, says Paul, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And yet, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring, his genos. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That means have a new mind. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness in a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance, pistis, to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul doesn't tell them about his tribe, the Jews, the Torah, and the covenant. Paul refers to their tribe, and he quotes the poets or the scholars in their tribe, and then goes all the way back to the beginning of all tribes, all nations. He goes back to Adam. And he made from one man, if you said that in Hebrew, you'd probably use the word Adam, every nation of mankind, that would also be Adam or Ha-Adam, the man, the Adam. Hebrew, Hebrew scripture, you know, often refers to all men as one man, ha-adam. It gets translated out because we don't think the Bible means what it says. He made from one man every nation of man to seek him, says Paul. Seek and you will find, says Jesus. So how is it that some men or women could not find God? How is that? See, I think that could only happen if you believe God didn't make some to seek him, in which case you must believe that Paul was lying. Or only if you believe that some will seek and never find, in which case you must believe that Jesus, the truth, was lying. You see, I think if you believe all of Scripture, it seems that you must conclude that all seek in a gazillion, bazillion, all seek God in a gazillion, bazillion different ways and all find Him for Jesus the way, the truth, and life has found us and makes us seek. He made from one man every nation of man, one Adam, every nation of Adam, to seek Him from one Adam. What Adam... What man is Paul talking about? I think we all assume it's the first Adam, the, the, the first man. But as we discussed at length last time, that Adam was alone because that Adam wasn't seeking his, his helper. In Romans 3, Paul quotes David and says, no one seeks, no one. Well, at least until, at least until one. Paul, uh, writes about the first man, Adam, and the last Adam, the eschatos Adam, which can be translated ultimate Adam, super Adam, or super, superman. And that Adam seeks not his own will, but the will of God. That's John 5.30. The will of God and one other thing, which must be the same thing, he seeks us. <laughs> Luke 19.10, Jesus said, I came to seek 
and to save the lost. So God made from one Adam, all Adams, he made from one Adam, and I wonder which Adam Paul is talking about, and I wonder if he's talking maybe about both, you know, first Adam and eschatos Adam, or last Adam. You know, the first Adam is literally manufactured by and with the last Adam. God makes man on the sixth day with what? A word. And we know Jesus is that word. God breathes his breath into clay. A word is logos in a breath, right? It's vibrations of reason or meaning on, on wind or, or air. And then as Jesus hung on the tree in the garden on the sixth day, he cried out, it is finished, and he delivered up his what? His breath, his spirit, his pneuma. On Easter, he breathed on his disciples saying, receive the holy pneuma, spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Paul writes this. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, a psyche or a soul. The last Adam, eschatos Adam, became a life-giving spirit, pneuma, breath, spirit. Now check this out, Romans 5, 14. Paul writes, Adam is a type, a tupos of him who is coming, literally him who is about to be, that's the eschatos Adam. Tupas is this fascinating word in Greek, if you ever look it up, because it literally means like imprint or form. It refers to the shape left behind after an impact. The first Adam, which is your old self, is the tupas of the eschatos Adam who mysteriously gives himself to you and is somehow also your true self. So, you can think of this as the eschatos Adam. Now, this is a, a figurine of Captain America. It would be better if this was Superman or Iron Man, or even better if, if it was Jesus, all right? This is, this is the good in flesh. This is God's will in flesh, the eschatos Adam. And this, this right here that Susan got me, this is, this is molding clay from Hobby Lobby, okay? It's molding clay. If you take the eschatos Adam and you press him into the clay, what you get is a tupas. So the first Adam is a tupas of the eschatos Adam. This is how we all begin. <laughs> this is what we all are at the beginning, uh, the tupas of the eschatos, the eschatos Adam. So there you go, see if I can stand him there. A minute, and there, there we, there we go. All right. Paul is telling us that this is what the first Adam was and is. This is how we all begin. See, if the if the last Adam is the good in flesh, then the first Adam is the imprint of the good in flesh. It's really the absence of the good in flesh. But at the same time, it's what? It's like a longing for the good in flesh. It's an emptiness. It is what it is not. It's not what Adam truly is, but more like a description of who he will be or should be. It's like knowledge of the good and yet the absence of the good. It's like the law. It tells us what we should be. If I think I can fill this void with myself, I create a false self, an ego. You understand, this is the description of, of every human soul in the beginning. Well, you could think of it almost as like an altar 
to the unknown God. Or perhaps a, a stinky manger. It is your need for love, and, well, you know, God is love. Well, I suspect this tupas was first formed when God breathed into the clay. But then it must have been further formed when the Adam sinned by taking knowledge of the good, right, from the tree in the garden. I suspect that it's formed every time we sin, every time we justify ourselves, every time we try to justify ourselves, attempting, to, why do we take the knowledge of good and evil? Well, we're attempting to make ourselves in the image of God. We have knowledge of the image of God, and we take more, and then we exercise our flesh to try to make ourselves more in the image of God. Sin is taking knowledge in life. It's taking love in the wrong way. Sin is a void. Grace is what fills that void. And we experience that now as faith. Romans 5.19, right after Paul describes the tupas, he writes this, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, the knowledge of good and evil, right? Came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Then in Romans 11.32, he sums everything up, saying God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. He made all a tupas that he might fill them all with himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, he sums it up this way. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. Verse 28, then the Son will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Through Christ, God is filling all things, but not only filling all things, he's subjecting all things to himself. Church fathers like Gregory of Nyssa taught that God in Christ Jesus does this by giving us his own will. He gives us his will, and that's the will to love, the will to subject yourself to another. It's love that binds all things together. So in Christ, God subjects all things to himself, but not from the outside in, like a God of war, but from the inside out, like a bridegroom romancing his bride and even making her his body like a God of love. That is, through Christ, God forms the void in you, the longing for love, and through Christ, God gives you the will to love, for Jesus is the will to love. Through Christ, he fills the void with love and makes you freely choose to love. That's the spirit of the Prince of Peace longing for home. Verse 44, it is sown a psychicon body, a soulish or natural body, a tupas. It is raised a pneumaticon body, a spiritual body. If, this is really good news. Do you have a natural body? If there is a natural body, yep, there is certainly <laughs> also a spiritual body. That's Christ's body. He's the spirit in that body. He's the promised seed. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, the eschatos Adam, became a life-giving spirit. So anyway, when did God give you his spirit? The spirit of the eschatos Adam. You know, the church has argued about this for 2,000 years. I think it helps to simply take the Bible literally. So Paul writes, don't you know, don't you get it? I'm not saying you're like this. I'm saying, he says, don't you know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells within you? See, that means that when God goes to all that trouble in the Old Testament of describing that old stone temple, what is he describing? He's describing your soul. He's describing the human soul. You remember that the temple was this large, mostly empty stone building in which people could walk around, and yet in the heart of the temple there was like this one room that was almost like a seed or something, the inner sanctuary, which was filled with the Spirit of God, the presence of God, and Jesus is literally the presence of God. A huge curtain separated the priests from the presence of God and the Holy of Holies. It 
See, it seems to me that this presence comes to your temple at first, the, the moment that God breathes into the clay. For that, that breath, it forms the void, and yet it also somehow inhabits the void. Remember this cartoon? Have you found Jesus? And there he is behind the curtain. See, I think that's the breath that makes you seek in the first place. It's the spirit of Jesus behind the curtain whispering to you, look for me, look for me, look for me. But, but when we come to Christ, because Christ has revealed himself to us, what happens? That curtain in the temple, it ripped from top to bottom, just as it did in the old stone temple on the day that Christ lifted his head and cried, it is finished, and delivered up his spirit on the tree in, in the garden. When we see him and surrender to him, his spirit begins to fill our temple from the inside out. The old man dies, the new man begins to live, the false self dies and the true self takes its place. The perishable is filled with the imperishable, according to Paul, and he says that must happen. The temporal form is replaced with the eternal substance. The last Adam, the eschatos Adam, is formed in the void that, that, that was or is the, the first Adam. That is, Christ himself is formed in you and it's no longer you that live, but Christ that lives within you. In other words, he is who you are. Jesus is God's judgment of you. He is who somehow, and I don't know exactly how all this works, but he is who you most truly are. In the very place you imagine that you could create yourself you come to realize that you have been created and always loved, dearly beloved. And you see, what makes this truly challenging, as if it's not hard enough to talk about already, what makes this really, really challenging to talk about is that, like the Bible teaches, the Holy of Holies is eternal. That means outside of space and time as we experience it. That's the coming age in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is eternal, the seed is eternal, and you must also be or somehow become eternal. For as Paul writes, the mortal must put on immortality. It will happen because it has happened. But right now, as King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, a thousand years before the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has put eternity into the heart of Adam. Yet not so he can find out what God has done from beginning to the end. And so he makes Adam seek. And so Paul said to the Athenians, he made from one man every nation a man to seek him. You seek him who is love because love has made you seek love, seek himself. He formed the void that is the altar to the unknown God. That is, love created your need for love, but he also gives you the desire to love, and love is losing yourself and finding yourself in another. Love is self-sacrifice. Love builds the altar and love even provides the lamb. Love consigns you to disobedience, and love gives you the desire for mercy. Love allows you to build a false self that you may witness the revelation of your true self. Love allows you to sin that you would seek grace and surrender to grace. Love makes you seek himself. Love is the peace child in you, longing for home, the city of Shalom, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. You have been created to seek and to find, for you have been found, and God is always seeking you and seeking through you. You, you seek him in the depths of your soul. As Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is, let God inhabit all of your temple. He's whispering to you from behind the curtain even now. You, you seek him in yourself and you seek him in your neighbor. As Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And who's your neighbor? Well, Samaritans. Jews in Israel, Greeks in Athens, the Sawi in New Guinea, the people in this room, everyone at the Christmas party. See, there's a baby in every manger. 
You're a temple. They are also a temple, and together we are all one big temple, the new Jerusalem city of peace. The city of peace is a temple coming down from heaven to earth. Last week we saw that God hides behind a curtain in the depths of the temple. God is playing hide and seek with his children, or maybe sardines. Better than hide and seek, writes Robert Fulgham. I like the game called sardines. In sardines, the person who is it goes and hides, and everybody goes looking for him. When you find him, you get in with him and hide there with him. Pretty soon, everybody's hiding together, all stacked in a small space like puppies in a pile. And pretty soon, somebody giggles and somebody laughs. In other words, they give themselves away with the laughter, and everybody gets found. Medieval theologians even describe God in hide-and-seek terms, writes Fulgham, calling him deus absconditus. But me, I think old God is a sardine player and will be found the same way everybody gets found in sardines by the sound of laughter of those heaped together at the end. My friend Sharon Hirsch was playing sardines with um, the children of, of one of her, her friends when the three-year-old found them all together in the dark basement in this hiding place. When she did, uh, Sharon says she gleefully exclaimed, everything I'm looking for is here. You see, when you finally walk through the gates of the New Jerusalem, I think that's what you'll say. Everything I'm looking for is here. The New Jerusalem is how God plays sardines with all of creation. And the New Jerusalem is a temple. And that temple is a body. It's the body of Christ, the eschatos Adam, the peace child. It's the city, the body of peace, Jerusalem. God made from one man every nation of man to seek him, says Paul. God makes every man with his word on a tree in a garden at the edge of space, time, and eternity. That tree is the judgment of God, the revelation of love, the, the door to the new creation. A couple of weeks ago after church, uh, Luke Vaccarella said to me, Hey, Pete, how do you explain the, you know, why this had to happen? How do, you, how do you explain the death and resurrection of Jesus to a four-year-old? And I said, yeah, that's a challenge. It's everything. It's the creation, salvation, and redemption of all things. <laughs> how do you explain it to a 50-year-old? Then I thought for a minute, and I said, you know what, Luke? Th this, is, this is what I can tell you. This is my best advice. Watch the Iron Giant. Just watch it, and then you tell Frankie, tell yourself, tell everyone, Jesus is like the Iron Giant, and you're Hogarth. 21 years ago, I took my kids to see the Iron, I mean, I did the math. This is shocking to me. It was 21 years ago, I took my kids to see the Iron Giant. At the end of the movie, they all thought that Dad had just totally lost it because I couldn't stop weeping. And that was because all at once, all these Bible verses, experiences, theological concepts that I had wrestled with, they like all came together. And all I wanted to do was stand up and scream, Eureka, I found it. All ye, all ye, auction free. All ye, all ye on the outs, come in free. Later I learned that what I saw was the thing that the early church fathers saw when they looked at the cross and then transformed the world by preaching the gospel. In the movie, the Iron Giant mysteriously falls to earth from heaven, and it becomes clear that he's capable of utterly destroying humanity. In other words, he's a god of war. You know, on Christmas Eve, you'll discover that Jesus is the commander of God's army. He's utterly capable of annihilating all things with just a thought. Well, in the movie, the Iron Giant is befriended by a lonely and fatherless little boy named Hogarth who says to the Iron Giant at one point, you are what you choose to be. Well, God is love. And God, God is free. Did you know that? God freely chooses to love. 
And Jesus is the incarnation of that choice, that, that judgment. God is free to be what God chooses to be, and God chooses to be the eschatos Adam, the Superman, Jesus. In the movie, the world powers learn about the Iron Giant, and utterly terrified of the Iron Giant, they launch a nuclear warhead to destroy the Iron Giant, not realizing that by destroying the Iron Giant, they destroy themselves and they destroy us, us all. Then, like Jesus said to his disciples, the Iron Giant says to Hogarth, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, and then he saves the world. That missile is targeted to the giant's current position. Where's the giant, Mansley? What? Oh. It's a missile. When it comes down, everyone will die. There it is. Who? <laughs> When Jesus the Superman was lifted up on the tree for the sins of the world, he saved the world. And yet the Revelation tells us that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And then at the end of the world, the edge of eternity in the Revelation, we see that the Lamb is standing as if he had just been slain on the judgment seat, the throne of God. You see, what Jesus did on the tree in the garden is a revelation of what God our Father is doing for all eternity and revealing in time. It's a revelation of love. Well, with the sacrifice of himself, the iron giant creates an imprint on Hogar's psyche, like a longing in Hogar's heart, an empty place, like an altar or a manger, Actually, he creates it in everyone's heart in the movie. For he dies for everyone. He exposes the sin of everyone and makes everyone long for grace as the pieces of his body broken rain down all over the earth. And then this happens. Oh, hey, Hogarth. Um, the general sent this to you. What is it? He said it was the only part recovered. He thought you should have it. I miss him. You see the altar, the manger, the box on the nightstand by Hogarth's head? See, it represents the empty place in Hogarth's soul. And, and did you see what was in the box, in the manger, in that altar? A piece of the Iron Giant. A piece of the Prince of Peace. Kind of like body broken and blood shed. Kind of like the hopes and fears of all the years. 
Kind of like a baby in a manger. Kind of like Christ in you, the hope of glory. Kind of like a decision in you to be who you are, the body of the Superman. You know, the first Adam was a, a tupos, right? He was a, a tupos of the eschatos Adam. And together, according to Scripture, we are all that Adam. So maybe each of us is Adam in some weird way, but also a piece of Adam. So maybe you're like the, the tupos, the, the imprint of the hand. And over the span of your life, through failure and forgiveness, seeking and finding, longing and fulfillment, you discover that you actually are the hand of the Superman. And maybe I discover that, you know, like I'm the, I'm the foot of the Superman. And, and that's neat, but, but it still makes us seek, right? Even more makes us seek, because what good is a foot without a leg, and a leg without a body, and a body without an arm, and an arm without a hand, and ultimately without a head? Ephesians 1 verse 10, this is the plan for the fullness of time, to anakephalio sosthe, to recapitulate in Latin, to bring together under one head, even wounded head, to unite all things in Christ Jesus. And how does this happen? Well, not from the outside in, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Through failure and forgiveness and longing and fulfillment and seeking and finding, God will give to each of us the faith, the hope, and the love of the Superman. You are what you choose to be, and you have been predestined to freely choose to be what you ultimately are, the Superman. And the government will be on his shoulders. It's his head. <laughs> and you have the mind of Christ. It's in your heart. It's, it's faith. So you will seek and you will find everything and everyone you've been looking for. So anyway, St. Paul stands on War God Hill and he says to the Athenians, the God who made the world and everything in it, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, have a new mind, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, in, by, or with, but the, the word is technically in. He will judge the world in righteousness in a man, whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance, pistis, faith, to all by raising him from the dead. Now this is wild, but that word pistis appears 243 times in the New Testament. 
In my English Standard Version, it's translated as faith 238 times, faithfulness three times, and belief one time. So 242 times is translated faith or a word that means faith, but this one time in all the Bible, they chose to translate it assurance. But literally, this is what Paul says. God has given faith to all by raising Jesus from the dead. Do you understand? Faith in you is... And, and you could, the Greek says this too, and we keep getting translated. Faith in you is the faith of Jesus in you. Faith is a gift. Faith in you is a piece of the Superman in you rising from the dead in you. God has given it to all, according to Paul. Even if now it lies in the depths of your being like a, a seed, apparently dead, but it doesn't remain dead. Faith in you is the life of the peace child in you, a piece of the Superman you. It's his choice, his judgment in you. And then what is the judgment on that day? Well, that is the Superman. Paul doesn't say God has appointed this man to judge, right? In fact, Jesus even said this. He said the Father has given all judgment to the Son, remember? And then he said, I judge no one. Paul doesn't say God has appointed this man to judge. He reveals that this man, the eschatos man, is God's judgment. That day, judgment day, is the day that you encounter Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And Paul clearly taught that that, that day, that, 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 that event is the end of the ages. So it happened, it does happen, it will happen at the edge of your time and eternity. The judgment is the revelation of reality. And it forces this question, will you freely choose to be what God has chosen you to be, the image and likeness of himself, the Superman, the body of the Prince of Peace? In other words, this is the judgment. The Superman took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you take and eat, and do it in remembrance of me. This is how we remember him. This is how his members end up coming together. <laughs> That's the judgment of God. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So this is how we are created, saved, and sanctified, and finished in the image of God. As long as you refuse this judgment, you will remain in outer darkness, where men weep and gnash their teeth alone and yet you will ultimately surrender to this judgment, for without this judgment, you wouldn't even exist. This is the judgment. Let us make Adam in our own image and likeness. And so God created Ha-Adam, the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And at the end of the sixth day, in the edge of eternity, God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And so he lifted his head on the tree in the garden, and he cried, It is finished. To enter God's rest, you must agree with his judgment. And I'm convinced that ultimately you will. But why not do it right now, today? Just pray this with me. Lord God, you can pray it silently in your heart. I surrender my judgment <laughs> to your judgment. I'm not salvation, I'm not my own creator. You're the creator. God is salvation. 
Jesus. Amen. And then you can come forward to the table and take one of the little cups. If you're at home, maybe you can break a little piece of bread. And by doing this, you are enacting the covenant. You are enacting God's judgment. You are incarnating God's judgment and speaking a prayer to the Lord all at the same time. As you break the bread, remember that it was you that broke the body of the Superman. You took his life. And yet also remember that it was him that gave his life. In other words, it, it, it confesses your sin and it's the belief in God's grace. And then, and then you take, that, you take that, that piece, that seed, that bit of the Prince of Peace and... You ingest it into the emptiness in your being. <laughs> and then what happens? Oh, you watch him rise from the dead and make all things new. That's called the gospel. It's good news. Believe it. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, Lord God, we thank you that you have made us to seek because from the foundation of the world, you sought and you found us. God, I thank you that you are always better than we thought. The love of Jesus is always deeper than we know. And the Spirit is everywhere working the wonders of mercy. And so seeking will not disappoint us. I think the way Paul says it in Scripture is hope will not disappoint us. That's impossible. For the one we hope in is the end and the beginning and the meaning of all things. And so we worship you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, now let me uh, mention this to you. I know I mention this every now and then, but especially with this sermon. Uh, Diana I used to always say, I used to always put those quotations and stuff, you know, in the old uh, up at lookout in the bulletin, which we don't really have time and space to do now, but it, like, if you go online, um, Heather, will, t will she'll make a transcript of this sermon. And like in this sermon, there are tons of footnotes. And the footnotes are there for a bunch of reasons because I don't want the sermon to be way too long. It's already too long, but I don't want to be way too long. And also because I, um, there's just all these quotes and um, stuff that I'd love for you to read. And, and I want you to read them so you know I'm not just making this stuff up. I mean, really what we were talking about today was what some theologians would call the recapitulation theory of the atonement or maybe the federal headship theory. But I think really all the theories in some, way, some ways are true. But I, it bugs me when pastors just make up stuff because it sounds good. But see, the wonderful news is I could never make up stuff that sounds better than reality because God our Father is the very definition of goodness. So anyway, all I'm saying is that if you go online uh, by the middle of the week, you can get the transcript and, and the footnotes, and uh, I hope that you, every now and then you do that and you read them. For the past 1,500 years, I think since, the, since about 500, the institutional church has been preoccupied with keeping our enemies out of the kingdom. And in that endeavor, I think we have really distorted the judgment of God. The judgment of God is to make from one men all people that they would seek God and find God and freely choose to be the manifestation of God, that is, one man, the body of the Prince of Peace, the new Jerusalem, <laughs> city of peace. And now sometimes people will ask me this, because I always set out to do this and I don't have time in the sermon. They ask, what difference does it make? And I, I seriously just about lose it. Because it's the difference between hell and heaven. It's the difference between the void and all creation. And right now it means that there's a baby in every manger. So just look around this room at all the mangers. <laughs> Old stinky mangers. There's a baby in every manger. You see, I just am barely beginning to believe that. 
But you know, if I really did believe that, oh, every day would be Christmas Day, and there would be gifts to open wherever I looked. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And hey, this is the joy candle, right? Oh yeah, so have joy! You can light that candle every day. Amen. Hey, if you'd like prayer, Ted's down here. I'd love to pray with you, but have a, have a wonderful week.